Well, good morning, friends. My name is Christian, and I'm one of the ministers here at Colonial Church. And we are so happy to welcome you this morning to worship with us. Whether you are first time, you decided to uh, hop on the internet and found our church, or whether you're a longtime member, we are deeply, deeply grateful that you are with us and that we will be connected together in and through the power of the Spirit. We pray that you enjoy this day, that you find connection to God and an openness to the Spirit in your own heart. Let us pray together. O oh God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths yet untrodden, through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, we are now in what is our third week of having an alternative space for worship as we're living into what it means to be one church with two expressions. As part of this, we're having this holding space during the time of COVID. It's an opportunity for us to get to begin to explore how we want to do worship and how we want to co-create this space together. So right now, the way that we're living into this is by exploring alternative ways for us through music to be able to relate to God and to bring our whole selves into worship. And over the next weeks and months, then together we'll keep wondering about how are we going to build this new space together? So again, if you're interested in being a part of co-creating this along with myself and Andrew and the rest of the leadership team, please feel free to send us an email. We would love to hear from you. Now, of course, whenever you're living into a space with some new language, it takes some time to figure out what that feels like and what it means to move our whole selves into worship together. So we wanted to give you a little bit of an introduction to each of the songs that we've selected for worship this morning. This first song is called Ring the Bells. When we selected this song, it was one of those moments where you didn't pick it knowing what the future would hold. And yet today as we move into worship, of course, we are people who have been living in the midst of our time this week. When here in our very own city, a black man has been killed. And this song is originally written and performed and one of the members is Johnny Swim, who is a black man. And he speaks about what does it mean to listen to the clarion call of Christ, to actually be the church, to be a place that reflects the kingdom of heaven, where no one is treated as less because of the color of their skin, but indeed we are people who join with the call of the God of all of us, the call of freedom, of life. And so indeed we are called to be a church, to ring the bells, to be a place of compassion, of justice, and of life for all. So as we begin to move into worship and sing, may we bring our hearts and ourselves into the space in view of the God who calls us all to ring those bells and let us cry for that justice together. Ring the bells this time on me. Bid the hatred fare thee well. Give back the pieces of my Jesus. Take your counterfeit to hell. But bang the drums, this means war. Not the kind you're waiting for. We say mercy won't be rationed here. That's what we're fighting for. All the sin and love and war that what the hell is love and eating for? so long behind your statues and your steeples does that hit too close to home i got faith to move a mountain and to watch that mountain move it's time for words to fall like thunder sounds of justice breaking through 
so excited uh, to have you with us this morning. I have several announcements. Uh, if you have kids uh, and uh, you're interested in our summer programming, we will be having summer camp. Um, it will be virtual. Uh, there'll be some other uh, kids programming going on. We have, of course, a, a big youth staff uh, right now. So please go to the website and check that out. And I would like to put in a plug as well that I'll be teaching a Sunday school uh, that's going to be starting on June 7th. Um, and it's going to be focused on the early Christian movement, uh, where we're going to be looking at the development of early Christianity and all the diversity and plurality and other kinds of challenges that the early first Christians faced together. Uh, last but not least, we are also still trying to find ways to, to love and serve our neighbors. And so our intrepid missions pastor, Paul Bertelson, has come up with an excellent idea of doing a drive-by food drive uh, and so, if you'd like some more information about that, check out this video. Hey, will someone turn on the lights? It's dark in this pantry. Man, this COVID quarantine is really getting to me. I've never felt so canned up in my whole life. Ho, ho, ho. Yeah. I know what you mean. Time is running out for me. I expire in 2023, and I've got people to feed. I can't stay locked up in this pantry forever. There are hungry people who need me. If only there was a way we could get to the Colonial drive through Food Drive Saturday and Sunday, June 6th and 7th. Yeah. That sounds great, but what about social distancing? We're not supposed to be closer than six inches apart. Once we get all packed up, we'll be touching each other. We're cans, man. That doesn't apply to us. It's the humans who need to stay safe. And not only will the colonial drive through food drive keep people safe, it will help feed people who really need us now. Yeah. Sounds great to me. What do you think, Doughboy? I invite you now to enter into these moments of prayer together. Take a deep breath. Let's calm our hearts, quiet our minds, and focus our attention on God's presence. Let us pray. 
Our Lord, on this Pentecost Sunday, we celebrate who you are for us and all that you have given to us. Today, we are especially grateful for the gift of your Holy Spirit. We are reminded how much we need and value the comfort of the Spirit's presence in our lives. We confess that many things disturb and dishearten us in these days of the pandemic. We look to you and thank you for the ways that you show up for us and bring your hope. We face daunting challenges these days. We have personal losses and obstacles in life. We confront the very human realities of racism, discrimination, violence, and hatred, injustice, and cruelty. All the things that polarize us and create tension in our communities. We pray for our city of Minneapolis and our whole region and ask for your healing in the death of George Floyd. We long to have understanding and compassion reign where bitterness, lies, and separation seem to continually win out. May your spirit provide the courage needed to keep in the fight, to keep hope alive, and to turn our anxiety into action. Will you be the balm that brings your soothing presence as you show us how to address this violence and the very real divisions that come from it? Give us your justice along with your forgiveness and your mercy. And eventually, we pray, your unity and reconciliation as we confront our own sins, both personal and in our communities. Only by your Spirit can we become who you created us to be. Only by your Spirit can we create the faith community you have always called us to be. Only by your Spirit will we be the change you have in mind for our world. And so we pray, let there be peace and let it begin with us. Holy Spirit, remind us of all that Jesus taught us. Keep all that we have learned front and center in our minds to the extent that it always impacts our choices, our words, our attitudes and actions. You who come in the stillness as well as the storm, in the still small voice as well as the earthquake, in the smallest flame, as well as the eternal power of resurrection. Be that power for us these days. Rekindle our hope, reinvigorate our resolve, and enable us to reimagine our future as you lead us and as we follow you. Amen. And now we lift up those in our community who need your touch today. Our Lord, we pray prayers of healing for Jean Waddell, Dick Schmoker, Frank Pascarella, Ben McFeeters, Patty Bruflot, Amanda Hargrove Martin, Jerry Hobbs, and Deb Snell. And prayers of comfort, Lord, for Marty Goodnow at the death of her father, Alden Goodnow, for Mary Lauka at the death of her husband, Larry, for Amy Stark at the death of her father, Dick Jensen. And mission prayers for our Innovate Protege Twin Cities Mobile Market as they bring in healthy food into the communities who are without those choices. Now I invite you to pray with me the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into trial, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we have the opportunity to pass the peace to one another. Connect with one another if you are present with others as you watch today. If you're not, contact someone who comes to mind. If you're alone, text them, send an email, or a quick phone call, just to say you're thinking of them and that you wish them well. And receive this blessing. May the Lord's presence bring you comfort and courage as you face the joys and the challenges of this day. Go in peace. 
Hey, if you are watching and you're a kid, I would invite you to maybe lean towards the TV or lean towards the computer. Each week for the next few weeks, for sure, the, whoever the pastor is who's preaching is going to share a little, what we're going to call a children's sermon. Uh, a little bit based on what the sermon is for the week, just to make a connection with you, maybe in talk in a way that you might better understand uh, what we're talking about. So this week, uh, we are talking about a story about a woman who comes to, to see Jesus. She comes to see Jesus in kind of an unorthodox, which means a not normal way. He is having dinner at a very important person's house, and she sneaks into the house to greet Jesus. When she gets there, she realizes she is a wreck. She is very emotional. This has been someone that she has met along the way and who has seen her, accepted her, and loved her. And so she sneaks into this Pharisee, this very religious person's house, and comes up behind Jesus crying, you know, can barely be consoled, and he, she starts to wash his feet. Out of gratitude for all that he has done for her, she washes his feet, dries it with her hair, and puts some perfume, one of her best things that she has, on his feet to show her appreciation for all that Jesus has done for her. You know, when I was in fifth grade, we moved from Seattle to Minnesota. It was a hard move. When I got here, I was kind of the odd kid out. I was the new kid, and, and some of the kids really just didn't like me because I was new. And so they took turns kind of picking on me to the point where sometimes they would even beat me up or steal my stuff or, or, or hold me down so that I would miss my bus. It was not a very fun time. I was scared a lot of the time. I was worried a lot of the time. Well, one day, this, this other boy in our class, who was actually a sixth grader, his name was David Peterson. David Peterson saw that I was getting mistreated by these other kids, and he, he jumped into the circumstance and pulled some kids off me and protected me. And he basically said to those kids, leave this kid alone, or you'll have to kind of deal with me. And you know what? For the most part, they did. I was so grateful. I just didn't know how I was going to show my appreciation to this new hero in my life. So I went home and I baked a pan of brownies. And then I went into my collection of stuffed animals and I picked out a bunny. Not this bunny, but a bunny. And that next Monday at school, I brought the bunny and that pan of brownies and I gave it to David Peterson and I said, I can't thank you enough, but I want you to know how appreciative I am of what you've done for me. And I want you to have this. You know, showing gratitude to God and to others because of the good things that they do for us is a good thing for us to learn to do. So my friends, let's learn that. Let's be people of gratitude as we thank those people around us who do special things for us and thank God for his love for us today and every day for you. God, we ask that you would help us to remember that you love us so much. And then out of gratitude for your love for us, help us to, to live a life of showing care and grace and love to others. For we pray this in your name. Amen. Today's scripture is from Luke chapter 7 verses 36 through 50. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating at the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to, to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, and the other 50. 
When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The word of the Lord. Well, I'd like to add my welcome this morning as well. It's Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost is a reminder of that moment where Jesus is about to ascend and he looks over his shoulders as his disciples and says, it's better that I go. Because as I go, then the Spirit can come. The Spirit will come in power and empower you. But that's the question. Empower us to, to do what? So let's pause and pray that our hearts and minds might be open as God speaks to us today. God, grateful that we can be in worship together. Grateful that we have your text, your words that lead us and guide us. We pray that you would give us open hearts and open minds, that we might be the church, that we might be your followers, that we might actually do the work you call us to do. For we pray this in your name. Amen. Pentecost. The birthday of the church. Jesus had been with his disciples, had been leading and guiding them, showing them the way, giving them examples of what it meant to be followers of God. But now it's time. He, he was born, he went to the cross, he died, he was resurrected, and now he's ascending, and Pentecost is coming, and now we live in the power of God's Spirit. You know... It's the Spirit of God resting upon God's disciples that filled them with the gifts that they needed and fills us with the gifts that we need to truly be the church, to live out God's call upon us. The Holy Spirit came to empower the disciples to spread the good news of Jesus. Think about this. The Spirit of the Master, the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit came and entered the lives of those people on Pentecost, and it collided with their spirits. We should think about that for a minute, because we all have spirits within us. It's, it's the Spirit in us which drives us and empowers us and gives us our sense of self. If you're like me, it also embarrasses you and frightens you and causes trouble for you. It's the Spirit that makes us who we are, but also hinders us from experiencing all that God desires for us. We have a spirit that oftentimes is defiant. It takes pride in itself. It wants to be in control. It wants to be independent. It wants to control itself. It is the spirit within us that the Holy Spirit came to empower, but there seems to be something in the way of us living out that true calling. Maybe we can learn from one of those old Aesop fables. It's a story about a tall, straight fir tree which stood towering up in the forest with very proud of its height and dignity and despised the little shrubs which grew beneath it. One day a bramble asked that tree why it was so proud. Because, replied the fir tree, I look upon myself as the finest tree for the beauty of any in the forest. My top shoots toward the clouds and my branches spread out around in constant loveliness. While you, a bramble bush, crawl around on the ground 
likely to be crushed by any animal that might come near. Well, all this might be true, said the bramble. But when the woodsman has marked you for cutting down and the axe comes to be applied to your roots, I fancy you will wish that you could change places with me. <laughs> Moral of the story, right? Pride always goes before the fall. It's that pride in oneself. It's that spirit of, I can do it on my own that keeps us from experiencing the leading that God's spirit wants to give us. Not only as individuals, but as the church itself. Yes, you and I are filled with pride. A pride which says we do not need God. We can do it on our own. We can figure it out on our own. But God comes to us with the spirit to replace our spirit of pride with the spirit of love and kindness and grace. A grace that then can actually empower us. You know we've been going through a series that now this week is coming to a close. About thinking about God's grace and what it does in our lives. God's grace is to empower us to live out our calling. Yes, you and I are filled with pride. But God can change that by the power of his spirit. The power to live different than our spirit often desires. <clears throat> a pastor once wrote, Once in a while the spirit comes. Sometimes it stings the soul. Sometimes it sakes us. Sometimes it troubles our conscience. Sometimes it soothes it. Sometimes it heals our pain. Sometimes it just helps us to endure it. It lifts the clouds just long enough for us to glimpse the city that was not made with hands in order that we can get back to taking up that cross and following Jesus. Yes, it's the Spirit within us, that Holy Spirit that comes to us and wants to empower us, again, to live out our true calling Wishing to encourage her young child's progress on the piano, a young mother took her child to a Paderewski concert. After they were seated, the mother spotted a friend in the audience and decided was, she was going to walk over and greet this woman. Well, seizing the opportunity to explore the wonders of the concert hall, her child rose and eventually explored its way through a door marked, wait, no admittance. Well, we all know what that means. Well, when the house lights dimmed and the concert was about to begin, the mother returned to her seat and discovered her child was missing. Suddenly, the curtains parted and the spotlights focused on that impressive Steinway on the stage. And in horror, the mother saw her child sitting at those keys, innocently picking out Twinkle, twinkle, little star, oh my. And at that very moment, the great piano master made his entrance, quickly moving to the piano and whispering in the child's ear, don't quit, keep playing, and leaned over this child, and this, his left hand began to fill in the bass part. And soon his right arm then reached around to the other side of the child and added a, a running abrigado. Together, the old master and the young novice transformed a frightening situation into a wonderfully creative experience. And the audience was mesmerized. I love that story. I, probably because that story reminds me of something I might have done. I'm sure there were many times that my mom looked on with horror with a choice that I was making. Here I was in the wrong place doing the wrong thing, right? <laughs> Just like this child. But I wonder, I wonder the outcome of that story. I wonder if God's spirit working with our spirit might mesmerize the world. A young man was an apprentice to a master artist who produced the most beautiful stained glass windows anywhere. 
the apprentice could not, could not quite get the master's genius. So he borrowed the master's tools, thinking that was the answer. And after several weeks, the young man said to his teacher, I'm not doing any better with your tools than I did with mine. The teacher paused and looked into this young person's eyes and said, so it's not the tools of the master you needed. It's the spirit of the master you needed. You can't get there by just going through the motions. You have to truly be led by the spirit. I love that idea. Because sometimes we can find ourselves just going through the motions, especially people of the church, doing the right thing, maybe even for the wrong reasons. To check a box, to just accomplish a good thing, to get it done with and move on. Maybe we have to pause and think that those opportunities to, to do good, to do well, to do the loving thing, is for a greater purpose, a greater possibility. And led by the Spirit, we can experience it. I love our gospel story for today. It's a familiar story. It's a Sunday school lesson kind of story. It's a story that can come up from time to time. It's one of those stories where the religious people of the day are trying to catch Jesus and see what he might do. And so this Pharisee has invited Jesus over for dinner, thinking there might be something in the time of dinner together that the Pharisees can use against him. And just like happened in many experiences of Jesus, the unexpected happens, and Jesus redeems it. During dinner, this woman sneaks into this Pharisee's house, a place there's no way she's ever welcome to be, in a circumstance where she's never supposed to go. And here she is. And all of a sudden, she's behind Jesus. And all of a sudden, she's on her hands and knees. And all of a sudden, she's washing Jesus' feet with her tears. And all of a sudden, she breaks open this, this box of very expensive perfume and begins to put it on Jesus' feet. It's probably her family's inheritance. It's probably all she's got, really. Well, what happens? The Pharisees, instead of you seeing what Jesus is doing, instead of seeing this beautiful act of grace and mercy and acceptance, they see this chance to condemn Jesus. Doesn't he know who she is? If he was a prophet, wouldn't he know who she is? And if he knew, would he allow her to do such things? Well, Jesus, knowing what was in their hearts, challenges them, questions them, asks them to rethink what they're thinking and the reason why they are thinking that, and says, grace, mercy, I came into your house, he says to the Pharisee, and you didn't greet me with a kiss. You didn't wash my feet. But here she is. She hasn't stopped kissing my feet, washing them with her tears. You, going through the letter of the law, have missed the point of the law. You, in doing the right acts for the wrong reasons, have missed the point altogether. We don't want to be like that, do we? We want to be people that are being led by God's Spirit that has been sent to empower us to do that which we wouldn't be able to do on our own. To do much beyond what we are believing we can do for a world that desperately needs it. Yes, this woman of difficult life, challenging life, needed God's love and grace and mercy, and Jesus offered it to her. Hard for us to imagine what that circumstance and situation would have been like for us. But Jesus shows us. Jesus shows us not only what he expects, but he shows us how it can be done. Are we just going through the motions? 
Are we just people that do the Christian thing? Or are we people that are discerning circumstances and situations and we're looking for God's leading by the power of His Spirit to know what to do? A prostitute came into the house of a Pharisee and was washing Jesus' feet. These religious leaders saw this woman who, who they had, would, would have completely disrespected. They would have cle- completely believed that she was beyond redemption. They would have literally turned their backs on her. But Jesus saw this woman. He literally saw this woman and offered the grace and acceptance and love that she needed. One of my favorite Theologians is a man named Tony Campolo. I've had a chance to hear him speak a number of times, and I've had a chance to meet him when he came to this church. It was quite, quite a thrill. I've been mesmerized by his stories many, many times. This is a story I've heard him tell twice. It's a story that happened to him many years ago. Tony, who grew up in the inner city of Philadelphia as a professor of sociology at Eastern College in And a few years ago, he flew into Hawaii to speak at a conference. The way he tells it, he checked into his hotel and tried to get some sleep, and unfortunately his internal clock woke him up at 3 o'clock in the morning. The night was dark, the streets were silent, the world was asleep. But Tony was wide awake, and his stomach was growling, and he got up and began to prowl the streets for looking for something where he could maybe grab some eggs and bacon for an early breakfast. And if you know anything about Tony, you can believe this is true. The man is fearless. Everything was closed, as you can imagine, except for this old kind of run-down restaurant in the back of an alley that caught his attention as he was walking by. He went in and he sat down at the counter. This old guy from behind the counter came over and says, well, what do you want? Well, Tony wasn't so hungry anymore, based on what he saw in the restaurant. So he did eye a donut or two under a plastic cover. He said that he would have a donut and some black coffee. And as he sat there munching on his donut and sipping his coffee at 3.30 in the morning, in walked nine prostitutes. Loud, laughing, engaging with one another. They just had finished their night's work. They plopped down at the counter, and Tony found himself uncomfortably surrounded by a group of smoking, swearing prostitutes. He gulped his coffee, planning to make a quick getaway. Well, just then, he heard the woman next to him say to her friend, because they were sitting on either side of him, and they were talking past him, You know what, she says? Tomorrow's my birthday. I'm going to be 39. To which her friend nastily replied, so what do you want me to do? Throw you a party? What do you want me to do? Bake you a cake? What do you want me to do? Sing you happy birthday? The first woman said, well, man, why do you have to be so mean? I, just, I was just telling you it's going to be my birthday tomorrow. I'm not asking you to do anything. I just, just wanted to tell somebody it's my birthday. Well, when Tony... Compolo heard that. He said, right then and there, he had to make a decision. He sat and waited until all the women left, and then he asked the guy behind the counter, do those women come in here every night? Yeah, he said. Well, what What about the woman that was next to me? Does she come in every night? Oh, yeah, every night. That's, that's Agnes. She's in there every night and has been coming in here for years. Why do you want to know? And Tony looked at this man who owned this diner, and he said, because she said tomorrow's her birthday. What do you think? You think maybe we we could throw her a little birthday party for her right here in this diner? Well, this cute little smile crept over this man's face, and he said, that would be great. And Tony said, yeah, I think it would be great. Let's do that. Just then, the man who owned the restaurant turns and 
yells back to his wife who's cooking the food, hey, come out here. This guy had a great idea. Tomorrow is Agnes's birthday. He wants to throw a party for her right here. His wife comes out and says, oh, what a terrific idea. You know, Agnes is really nice. She's always trying to help other people, and nobody does anything nice for her. So they made their plans. Tony says he'll be back at 2.30 the next morning with some decorations and a cake. And that's when the man, Harry, it turns out that's his name, who owned the restaurant, said, I'll make the cake. So 2.30 the next morning, Tony's back. He has crepe paper and other decorations and a big sign that he made that said, Happy birthday, Agnes. They decorated the place from one of the end to the other. It looked great. Matter of fact, Harry said he hadn't seen it look so great. And Harry had gotten the word out to the streets about the party. And by 3.15, it seemed like everyone who was working at that hour was in his place. There were prostitutes wall to wall at 3.30 in the morning. And at 3.30, on the dot, the door swung open and in walked Agnes. Tony had everybody ready. And they all shouted and screamed, Happy birthday, Agnes! Well, Agnes was absolutely flabbergasted. She was so stunned she didn't know what to say. Her mouth just fell open. Her knees began to shake. She almost fell over. And her eyes filled up with tears. And when the birthday cake with all the candles was carried out, she totally lost it. She was sobbing. She was crying. Harry, who was not used to seeing a woman like this crying, didn't know what to say, so he just said, Agnes, blow out the candles. Agnes, let's just cut the cake. So she pulled herself together and blew out the candles. Everyone cheered and yelled, cut the cake, Agnes, cut the cake. But Agnes just kept looking down at that cake. And she just would not take her eyes off that cake. And slowly and softly, she looked up at Harry and said, if it's all right with you, I mean, if you don't mind, I mean, would it be all right if I were to ask, I, I mean, is it okay if I, I just keep the cake a little while? Is it all right if we just don't eat it right away? Harry didn't know what to say, so he, he shrugged and said, sure, if that's what you want to do, keep the cake. Take it home if you want. Oh, could I? Agnes asked. Looking at Tony, she said, I live just down the street a couple of doors. I want to take the cake home. Is that okay? I'll be right back, I promise. I just want to show my mom this cake. She got off the stool, picked up the cake, and carried it right out the door. It, it, she carried it like she was carrying the Holy Grail. Everybody watched in stunned silence, and when the door closed behind her, nobody seemed to know what to do. They looked at each other, and they looked at Tony. So Tony got up on a chair and said, it's Agnes's birthday. Why don't we say a prayer for Agnes? To literally everyone's surprise, it was completely silent. And there was Tony in this kind of hole-in-the-wall greasy spoon, as they used to say, filled with Honolulu's prostitutes at 3.30 in the morning. And here's Tony Campola praying for Agnes on her very first ever birthday party. And Tony prayed for her life and her health and that she would maybe find the love of God. Tony recalls, I prayed that her life would be changed and that she would sense God's presence. That she would know that God is good and that God loves her. When Tony finished his prayer, Harry leaned over with a trace of hostility in his voice and he said, Hey, hey, 
You never told me you were a preacher. What kind of church do you belong to anyway? And in one of those moments, we all know what these moments are like, when just the right words come out, Tony answered him quietly, I belong to a church that throws birthday parties for prostitutes at 3.30 in the morning. Harry thought for a moment, and in a mocking way said, no, you don't. You see, there isn't a church like that. If there was, I'd join a church like that. Yeah, I, I'd join a church like that. Are there churches like that? Can we be that kind of church? A gathering of followers of Jesus, empowered by the Spirit, that can freely offer the grace that we have received with others? I hope so. I hope we can recognize that that was the whole point of the Spirit coming so that we would be empowered to offer this good news, this grace-filled, love-filled message from God that I love you. I will never leave you or forsake you. I am with you to the very ends of time. We're going to have to overcome our pride and our prejudice and our judgment and our self-centeredness to do it. But that's what the power came for, is to transform us, to help us become that what God desires for us to be. Led by God, a willing, empowered spirit can do that very thing that the church is called to do, to be that witness of God's love. Well, my friends, it, it doesn't take much of our imaginations. It doesn't take but a couple looks in the newspaper or watching the news to recognize we've got our work cut out for us. But that's why we gather together each week to empower and encourage one another, to keep reminding each other that there's a calling upon us as individuals and as the church, and to cheer each other on to live as God not only calls us to, but empowers us to live. You see, people will join a church. They'll come and join the fellowship of a church that is living out its values and living out its calling. So my friend says, we close in prayer. Let this be your prayer, too. Let it be a prayer that says, God, I want you to come and transform my spirit from one of self-centeredness and pride to one that can be used, led by your spirit, to care for a needy world. Now, I don't know what that means for you. I don't know if that's the neighbor next door or that friend from work or that kid at school. I don't know what that means for you. But if we're willing, God will hear our prayer and work through our prayer to do God's good work in us and through us. So let's pray. God, grateful we are that you have not abandoned us. As a matter of fact, when you left, you sent us your Holy Spirit that fell upon us in such a way that it transformed us forever. Those early disciples were given languages they'd never learned so that they might speak to those that were gathered and share that good news. So God, we ask that you would give us the languages we need to share the good news with the world that's around us. A language of grace and mercy, an invitation to come and be in relationship with, to experience God's love through God's people, through me and my brothers and sisters of this gathered group called Colonial. We're grateful you hear our prayers. 
For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Jeff, thank you so much for that sermon and for the invitation to live into a grace that empowers us, to live in grace, to be the church, to pay attention, to be transformed. As we turned to worship again through music, I invite you to listen to this song, to listen for the invitations for us to be a people who pay attention to where God is asking us to be a people who likewise embody and extend that grace to one another. So may we look and may we see and pay attention. Let us worship together. A man stumbled into the railway station His spirit was tired So much hesitation from those around Unwilling to stop and say Hello, how are you? Such a simple phrase carries the power to Change their day so instead they say nothing while he plays The sounds coming from his string So few times have there been things more pure in this world More pure in this world Can't be found there We don't 
Grace Actually. This is the name of the sermon series that we have been working ourselves through over these last many weeks. And uh, the word for grace, as you've heard in a couple of sermons, can also be translated as gift. The Greek word charis can be translated as gift or generous. And this is the time in the service where we have the opportunity to be generous. So as you feel empowered or led by God and as you're able, please do give. You can either mail in your gift, you can come by the church and drop it off, or visit our website where you can find opportunities uh, by which you can give electronically or through texting. So as you prepare, as you think about what it might mean for you to give, let me please pray, pray a quick blessing over our gifts. Lord, we give thanks to you for this day, the gift that you've given to us, which is life. And we thank you for all the ways that you bless us. We know, Lord, even in our need and in our abundance, you are present with us. We pray now that you be with us, you be with the gifts that are given, and let them be put to work to serve you and to build up your church and to serve this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for that invitation, Christian. Our final song of worship today is a song that probably many of you have not sung in church before, but it's a song I bet many of you have sung. It's a song called Let It Be. And in part of our intention in this new space for worship is that we break down the divides in our world between what gets to count as sacred and what is secular. Because God is the God of all things, and any invitation into surrender and into life is an invitation deeper into the love of God in Christ. So today, as we come into worship, let us sing this last song together, let it be, with our hands open in surrender to the God who was and is, the God who meets us and encounters us, that we would release our desire for control and instead open ourselves to the grace that actually invites us to be people who are empowered to live in the spirit and to extend the kind of kingdom good news in the whole of our lives to one another. So let us open our hands and let us build a kingdom where all can breathe. find myself in times of trouble mother mary comes to me speaking words of wisdom let it be and in my hour of darkness she is standing right in front of me speaking words of wisdom let it be oh let it be let it be For words of wisdom, let it be. And when the broken hearted people living in the world agree, there will be an answer, let it be. But though they may be parted, there is still a chance that they will see. There will be an answer.
Well, none of us would have predicted or thought that last fall, as we moved into the year of the good neighbor, that this is where we would be. And yet here we are. And one of the beautiful things about the call of Christ and the invitation to be the church is that that invitation doesn't end or, or go away just because the world changes or pandemics happen. No, indeed, the call to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves is even more important and necessary in our time. We're not done being good neighbors. God's work in this world is not finished. And so as we wrap up this year and this call for us to be good neighbors, this call of us to live grace actually we don't want it to end. We, we, we want to be the people who invite God's spirit to continue to change and transform us that indeed we might live our lives in response to the greatest commandment, to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. So as we have heard in these last weeks, grace actually, grace actually is the thing that empowers and emboldens us to actually be the church. So let us be people of that grace, a grace actually that sees, a grace that restores, a grace that frees, a grace that is generous, a grace that empowers us. Let us be people of grace, for indeed we are loved by the God of all grace. Let us turn to our neighbors, let us turn to the world, and let us in this way be the church. If you're in, we hope you'll join us in the coming weeks this summer as we make the turn to wrestle together more deeply about what does it mean as we are the church to be a people who participate with God in the bringing of God's kingdom. So may you go in the grace of God, a grace actually that changes and empowers and emboldens us. May this grace hold you in love. May it sustain you. May the Spirit Breathe indeed that everyone of every color and every language, even us, might be people who are transformed by grace. Go in that grace, my friends. Amen. <laughs>